Please turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter. I'll be reading 2 Peter chapter 2. Last week we looked at God's salvation and judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. We learned how uh, Sodom and Gomorrah had been taken as captives of war. They had lost everything. Abraham then saves them for the sake of righteous lot. And years later, these cities that had been saved, these cities that had seen uh, Melchizedek, the, the king of righteousness, come out to greet them with bread and wine. He prepared a table for them um, in the wilderness, uh, in the midst of their enemies that had been conquered. Um, and uh, Abraham tithed. My understanding of his tithe is he is tithing a tenth of what had been taken as plunder, what the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had lost, everything. And they were to always be reminded uh, of that God's salvation. They should never have forgotten whenever they sat at the table, whenever they went to bed and kissed their children goodnight, um, that it was because of God's righteous salvation. Uh, they could have looked around their home and, you know, if they had ten chairs and there's only nine there, uh, that's because uh, one-tenth of that was tithed to the king of righteousness, one of the great types and shadows of David's greater son, Jesus. But as we learned uh, then years later that the very ones who had been delivered from oppression and captivity, complete poverty, they had nothing, and delivered, the, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah forgot and they became the tormentors and the oppressors so that the, the cries of the poor, which we just sang from in Psalm 71, were coming up before God and the God Most High had heard that and he had come down then to see if that indeed was the case. Uh, and it was indeed the case. And uh, God brought judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. At Bible study, we noted the promise, uh, prominence of Sodom and Gomorrah and the prophets and the ministry of Jesus. So you'll, you'll find that Israel, too, was redeemed, and they became like Sodom and Gomorrah, forgetting their redemption, forgetting how they had been slaves but freed, how God had washed and provided hospitality for them in the wilderness, and, and how they had then used uh, their, their wealth, their care, and their ease, and their arrogance to, to oppress uh, the poor and the, the stranger, the orphan, and the widow. Uh, and the prophets condemned um, Israel for becoming like, or even worse, than Sodom and Gomorrah. I think one of the most moving chapters, uh, if you have time to read this afternoon, is Ezekiel 16, uh, where Ezekiel then also makes that connection, not only in God's provision and salvation and, and compassion and gentleness that he showed, uh, but the treachery of, of Israel years later. And of course that treachery continued when the Lord again visited Israel in Jesus' day and sent his messengers out and his messengers were rejected and Jesus said that and pronounced a woe that it would be more tolerable, tolerable on the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for the cities of Jerusalem uh, that would not receive him. In fact, his own did not receive him. They, they crucified the son of glory. And we also noted how Sodom and Gomorrah is a, a warning to us also. Uh, it's not just a warning uh, against sensuality, which it most certainly is that, uh, but it's also a warning and example that we commit righteousness and justice. Uh, God chose Abraham in Genesis 18:19. And he gave Abraham children, a child, a son, the son of the promise, to instruct him in the way of knowledge and righteousness. And that knowledge and righteousness then was to be taught generationally. Um, and regrettably, often we forget that. And the church is in danger also of becoming like Sodom in that way. And Peter is reminding us uh, of these things. Today we'll be looking at Balaam and introducing uh, the false prophet Balaam. So I'll be reading from Second Peter. I'll read the entire chapter, hear the living word of the living God. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned, and in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to pits of darkness, reserved for judgment, 
and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties, whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, they count it a pleasure to re revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his transgression for a mute donkey, speaking with the voice of a man restrained the madness of the prophet. These are springs without water and mists driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you so very much for your word and for Peter's reminder. We thank you for the contrast, how your word is a lamp and a light, and that contrast now that even those who are in the church and claiming to be prophets and proclaiming your word, that the, the black darkness has been reserved for such false teachers. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to cling, to hold fast to your word. Pray that you would keep us from straying and turning aside. We thank you for the many examples, uh, not just uh, the examples of righteousness and those who persevered. Thank you for those examples that we've been learning in the life of righteous Noah and of Lot. Uh, we think of the many negative and bad examples as well as we today begin to look at the false prophet Balaam. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the, the good shepherd. And I pray that you would impress upon us today our poverty uh, and our need for deliverance and salvation. We thank you for that deliverance that has begun uh, with your death and finished work at the cross. We thank you that you have begun a good work in us. And I pray that you would bring it to completion. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. We've been looking at, at Peter as he's talking about salvation and judgment. And we've been looking at it in the context of hospitality. And uh, it, we're, Peter is continuing this theme of hospitality. Um, you can think of hospitality in terms of God's uh, hospitality to our first parents in the garden. 
Um, he provides everything for them. It was paradise. Um, and regrettably, our first parents uh, entertained guest, a guest. They entertained the serpent, uh, and they well, should not, but they entertained um, his lie, and they partook of it. Um, and for that, they were cast out of the garden with the promise that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Noah, of course, as we've looked at, uh, hospitality is a major theme with Noah. Um, he was hospitable in the ark that he built. He invited the world to the hospitality of the ark, warning the world of the coming judgment. And all, any who believed were welcome to come uh, and to believe in God's coming judgment and to step us into the ark. Um, and not only was the hospitality offered to the world, um, it was offered to uh, the two of every kind that he brought into the ark. Just think of God's hospitality and, and Noah building that, the ark according to the commandment of God. So Noah, it's not because it's coming into Noah's idea. I think the ark should look like this. No, just as Moses was shown the pattern for the building of the tabernacle, Moses was shown the pattern for the building of the ark. He obeyed God's commandment by building that ark. And, of course, two of the birds of every kind, of the animals after their kind, every creeping thing on the ground after its kind, two of every kind, uh, came to him and were kept alive. It was God's preservation of the earth. It was that earth then that Noah got off of after the flood. It is the earth in which we now live. It was the earth in which God, in his mercy and his grace, grace after saving Noah and his household, he gives the sign of the, the rainbow, um, and with that sign of the rainbow, God promised that he would never again destroy the earth, and God gave a promise that we would continue, despite the fact that we live in a sin-cursed world, despite the fact that the flood had not changed the heart of man at all, uh, God would continue to bless seed time and harvest uh, uh, day and night, summer and winter. We, we enjoy that. Again, a happy second day of spring. This is part of God's promise that we enjoy seasons of planting and pray for God's blessing on that. That God, uh, the entire earth to this day enjoys God's hospitality in that regard. Everyone that sits down at the table, this is part of God's common grace. It is because of God's promise and his covenant, um, and yet we should never take that for granted or use the things that God has so graciously and, and given us in his goodness to use them for our own sinful selfish purposes. Then we have looked at Lot, and we looked at uh, the hospitality of Lot. Of course, there's a lot more that we could look at. Abraham's entertaining of the angels, um, and then Lot's entertainment of the angels. Um, we noted how the people of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, received God's hospitality when they were rescued, and how then they turned against the hospitality, including they turning, turned against Lot's righteous household, um, and uh, the, the terrible things that they were going to do to Lot himself with the homosexual rape. And now we come to another occasion of the Lord's hospitality, and it's, it comes with the story of Balaam. And uh, Peter mentions Balaam by name in verse uh, 15 of our text, uh, speaking now of those who are going to be within the church. So Peter is telling us, uh, the kinds of false teachers that will be uh, with us until Jesus returns. And they will, he compares them, forsaking the way they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. This, too, is part of the story of God's hospitality. Balaam now comes in the period of history of the Exodus. And in the Exodus, you remember, is, is the story of Israel, exiting from slavery. The exodus begins with God's people and their cries going up before the Lord. Those were the same cries that brought God down to Sodom in the first place in Genesis 18. Now the cries of the Israelites because of their slavery, their oppression, the death of their um, infant males, their cries are going up before the Lord. And Moses says in Exodus 2, verses 23 through 25, uh, that the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. Now, as God, the, as the Exodus then proceeds, um, God brought about ten plagues upon the Egyptians. God sent Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh, and they said to Pharaoh, as prophets of God, in the name of God, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh continued to harden his heart to the word of God. He would not listen. So here's salvation and judgment. God is going to save his people. Pharaoh and God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Who is the Lord that I should fear him? Who is the Lord that I should give you a vacation or time off to let you go and worship him in the wilderness? I, I don't recognize this God of yours. It's the gods of Egypt that Pharaoh uh, thought were supreme. So God humbled Pharaoh um, and, and laid waste to the, the kingdom of Egypt, and God very mercifully then saved his people. Uh, we remember that in the, time, the Passover. We remember that when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, which we celebrate today. And then, if you turn with me in your Bible, along came Balaam in Deuteronomy chapter 23, which is a summary of what happened. The actual account goes back to Numbers 22, 23, 24, and 25. There's um, just as much real estate that Moses gives on his Torah scroll, just as much real estate to the story of Balaam as to the story of the flood, just as much real estate to the story of Balaam, the false prophet, as to the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and, and Peter is now saying that this Balaam um, is as well... Um, it is a warning for us of what the church will face as we await the blessed hope of Christ's return to judge the living and the dead. So if you, before we read from Deuteronomy 23, which gives a nice summary of uh, Numbers 22, 23, 24, and 25, um, God, God not only redeemed his people, he brought his people mercifully to Mount Sinai, God revealed his law from heaven, and in the revealing of his law, he writes his law in tablets of stone, and he places those tablets of stone in the Ark of the Covenant. And, and Moses at, and Israel at Mount Sinai, they build the tabernacle. And, and this is one of the glorious things of God's redemption. God says, I will dwell in your midst. So for the, the tents for all of the hundreds of thousands of families that had been redeemed from slavery in Egypt as they come out of Egypt into the, to Mount Sinai, God, as they're there, he has started to prepare a table for his people in the wilderness. Kind of like Melchizedek pre pre prepared a table for Abraham as he came back uh, with the, the, uh, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. God provided bread. God provided water. God provided for the clothing of the Israelites. He, he provided for all of their needs. And very wonderfully, God, in his provision, and again, this is the idea of hospitality, God then says, here's my home, my tabernacle, which was constructed very much like the ark, very much like the creation of the world. There's a lot of Sabbatarian references in the construction of the ark and also in the construction of the tabernacle. And, and God says now, this is, I will dwell in your midst. I will provide for you. I will provide for your uncleanness, your sin. I will wash, here's the laver, the basin. Here is the blood of the covenant. Here is the table of the showbread. And I will provide. And, and you will, I will be your God. You will be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of you. And, and it, it, after then, in Leviticus chapter 10, in verse 10, God's people then leave from Mount Sinai, and God's people take them, and be, uh, God begins to lead his people with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to the, the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, one of the things that happens on their way to the promised land with God dwelling in the midst, and it was very beautiful. You, you had God's tabernacle. So it, it, this is his tent. This is God with us. And it, with God's tabernacle, you'd have three tribes then they would put their tents on the north, and then they would put three tents on the south, three on the west, and three on the east. So the, God was in the midst of his people, and he was leading them. He was shepherding them. He was providing for them. And it was an example to all of the nations. The nations begin to look at this, and, and they say, look at God's salvation. 
And the nations were looking at that because that also meant their judgment. God, God's 400 years plus of patience with the Canaanites was now coming to an end. And so as the Israelites are, are triumphantly marching and God uh, in their midst, one of the pagan kings and, um, looks out. And the pagan king knows, and his name is Balak. All right, so there are two names, new, two new names maybe for you today. Balak, he is the king of Moab. And Balaam, he is the false prophet that Balak hires to curse the people of God. Balak now knows as a Moabite, and that's a descendant of Lot, in case you didn't know. He knows as a Moabite king, just as uh, Rahab knew, living in Jericho, that this was the end. God's judgment and destruction was at hand. For 400 years, they, they had resisted and they continued to fill up the cup of God's wrath. And now the cup of God's wrath was going to be poured out on them. And Balak knows this is going to happen to him. And so he hires a false prophet. And Moses summarizes this for us. We'll go back in a minute to Numbers 22. But Moses summarizes this in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verses 3 and 4. So this is about 40 years later. And Moses reminds the children of Israel, No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of their descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord, because they did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. That is a summary of why they are cursed. They are not allowed to the 10th generation. Now, there's more to this story, as you might imagine, uh, as well. The story of Ruth, uh, think of that. But um, you did not show hospitality to God's people. You did not bring out to them bread and water. Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. And, and you did not welcome my people. In other words, you did not welcome the tabernacle that was leading them. And because you not only did not do that, but you tried to curse the people of God to the 10th generation, you will never receive the blessing of God. Hospitality. You did not meet me. You did not meet my people with food and water. So turning back now in Numbers chapter 22 through 25, and again, think of what Jesus said, to, to give a cold cup of water to a true man or prophet of God is to receive the prophet's reward. Uh, so so there, there's a great blessing to be had to be a part of God's people. Now, Balaam is probably the most famous non-Israelite prophet in the Bible. Um, he does take up Numbers 22, 23, 24, and 25. He's mentioned elsewhere. Uh, you'll find Balaam in the prophets. You'll find Balaam in Micah chapter 6 and verse 5. Probably you'll look at this at Bible study. Hosea also mentions Balaam in Hosea 9, verse 10. I think next week we'll sing about Balaam. He's also in the Psalms. He's in Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. He's here in Second Peter of our text. Balaam, he's in the New Covenant now. Um, you'll find him in Jude, verse 11. Jesus mentions him by name to the church at Pergamum in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. And what I want you to, to see that this, this is on the same similar scale as the uh, the fall of Adam and Eve, not, not quite as big, but it, it's like the Noah's flood. It, it's like righteous Lot and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And now the false prophet for whom everlasting darkness, Peter reminds, that, that, that this same spirit, this same false prophet is still going to be in the midst of the church until Jesus returns. Uh, again, in the book of Revelation, it's, it's there. It's, it's with us today. The, Balaam was one of the most famous, again, non-Israelite prophets, in the ancient world. What Moses and Elijah were, who they were to the Jews, Balaam was to non-Israelites. In fact, archaeologists have found ancient inscriptions of Balaam's sayings. One such inscription, um, I think it was near Jericho, it dates back to King Uzziah. So King Uzziah is the 8th century, so it's still Balaam lived long before that, but his, his prophecies 
um, archaeologists have found inscriptions of them. So this one inscription that they found uh, reads, and I think there's more to it, uh, the sayings of Balaam, son of Beor, the man who was a seer of the gods. Um, and so this is a, a man who had tremendous influence, and he still does, Peter says, to this day. Now, if you look with me at Numbers chapter 22 and verse 18, and, and what we are to be learning from this, Balak then hires the king of Moab, and he, he, or Balak, I'm sorry, the king of Moab, he hires Balaam, and he says, Balaam, I want you, because we know that you're a prophet, we want you to curse Israel. And Balaam says this to him in Numbers chapter 22. Um, so Balak comes to him, and Balak says in verse 18 of chapter 22, um, <clears throat> Balaam replied to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. I, wa I want you to see that. I want you to see what is here in the text. Here you have the most infamous false prophet in scripture, and maybe all of history. And yet, what does he confess here? I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of Yahweh, my God. How, how, does, how does Balaam confess Yahweh as his God? I don't know. I, I don't know. People sometimes ask me, Aaron, why did such and such an evangelist fall? I don't know. How did that church become so corrupt with the immorality and the lawless deeds and the cover-up? How did that happen? I don't know. But Peter warns that this is what is happening and will happen. I don't know. False prophets, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Balaam not only confesses Yahweh as his God to the king of Moab, Balak, Balaam then speaks the word of God. Now this is a long account, but look at verse 12 of Numbers chapter 23. Numbers 23 and verse 12. He replied, Must I not be careful to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? Notice again, what Yahweh puts in my mouth. Who, who is, where is this guy coming from? This, yeah, Moses and Aaron appear before Pharaoh and said, Thus saith the Lord, thus saith Yahweh. Let my people go. Here, here is this prophet, Balaam, who says, Yahweh is my Lord. I cannot speak anything. I can only speak from these lips what Yahweh puts in my mouth. You, Balak, want me to curse the Israelites. I cannot if the Lord my God does not put that curse on my lips. How does this work? I do not know. And then what happens in the account is Balaam then makes seven prophecies in chapters 23 and 24. How does he do this? I do not know. We don't have time to look at all of the seven prophecies. But I want you to look at um, Numbers chapter 23 and verses 10 through 12. Every time Balaam opens his mouth to curse Israel, a blessing comes out. Much to the consternation of the king of Moab. The king of Moab's like, I'm not hiring you to bless the Israelites. And the, the Israelites don't at this point know what's even happening. I, I think, and and this, is, this is one of the points that Peter is encouraging us with. The Lord knows how to save and deliver you and me. We, we have no idea about the, the, the kinds and, and the forces that are, are that would sift us as wheat. We have no clue. It's real. Peter says it's real. False prophets will even be, just like Balaam, 
They will be in the midst of the church, taking the name of the Lord upon their lips, taking the word of Lord, the God on their lips. And every time Balaam, though, and, and again, this is God for his people, God with us. Every time Balaam opens his mouth to curse, a blessing comes out, and many great prophecies. And Balak, the king of Moab, should have heard, but he did not. So look with me at Numbers chapter 23, and verses 10 through 12. This is one of the times in which Balaam opens his mouth, um, and, and he says in the presence of uh, the king and the leaders of Moab, Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright, and let my end be like his. Then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have actually blessed them. He replied, Must I not be careful to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? So the, the, the first prophecy is a blessing. And, and uh, what's going, I don't know. It's the high priest lips that the blessing is supposed to come out. That, that, that was the purpose of the priesthood. You, know, we, we, you read through the whole book of Leviticus. There's a lot there. And at the very end of all the sacrificial system, the high priest raises his hands. Now you have this Balaam in the, the presence of Balak, the king of Moab, and all of his rulers. And what's he doing? He's blessing Israel. And he's proclaiming God's covenant to, of, to Abraham. How, how, Balaam, do you know this? Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? That's what God said to Father Abraham. Father Abraham has no children. And Abraham believes that God will bless him and that his descendants will be more numerous than the sand of the sea, more numerous than the stars of the sky, more numerous than the dust of the earth. And now Balaam is proclaiming the fulfillment of this prophecy. And he is blessing the Lord. And he's blessing well, the, God, the people of God. He's supposed to be cursing them. And then he says, I want to be one of them too. <laughs> Let me die the death of the upright. Let my end be like his. Balak is hearing the gospel from the lips of this false prophet. God was with ways in, it, in Israel that they did not understand. God is with you and me in ways we don't understand. I'm, I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful for the intercession of our great high priest, Jesus. Peter then, as we don't, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I know what's going on and we'll explain more. But Peter brings up Balaam for a reminder to us and the reminder to you and to me is that we need to be paying careful attention to the word of God. We have the prophetic word made more sure, 2 Peter 1 verse 19, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Some of you have asked about the morning star. I think it comes up with Balaam, so we'll, I'll try to tie that together in the, the Bible study. 2 Peter 3 and verse 2, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Peter is warning us in chapter 2 that there are false prophets in the church who also call Yahweh their God, and his word is in their mouth, and yet they will still lead you, they would lead me, if they could, astray. So again, note there's a, a comparison that Peter he begins his letter in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 3 and 4, reminding us of the divine power of God, how he has granted his divine power, everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. God's delivered you. He's delivered me from the corruption that is in the world by lust. But he, Peter is reminding us that we still need to be saved because there are elements, there are forces, there are false prophets that would lead us back to that corruption and back to these lusts of the flesh. So if you look at the uh, end of chapter 2 and verse 18, of the, these, these false prophets like Baal, speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, 
by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For after, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, and Peter wrote, he begins the letter, you've escaped these things through faith in Jesus. But these false prophets now are in your midst, and after escaping these defilements by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. Peter would have us to understand that we must pay careful attention to the word of God and God must save us. I, we need to be saved from this. We need to be saved from false prophets. You and I cannot be saved from false prophets through our own knowledge and through our own wisdom and understanding. We need a savior. We need Jesus in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God is able, and, and, and Peter says over and over, notice what God did in the days of Noah in verse 5. He preserved Noah. If it weren't for God's preservation, Noah would never have been preserved. Verse 7, he rescued Lot. If it were not for God's rescue of Lot, Lot never would have been saved. And the Lord knows in verse 9 of chapter 2, he knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. One of the things about Balaam is that no matter how much Balak, the king of Moab, demanded Balaam to curse, Balaam could not. And he continued to bless over and over. So you might be thinking to yourself, what's so bad about Balaam? He couldn't curse. He could only bless. Well, Balaam, and Jesus mentions this explicitly also in Revelation 2, but turn back with me to Numbers chapter 25. Do you remember how it began with the king of Moab, Balak, not showing hospitality. No bread, no water. Balaam came up with another plot. We'll show Israel hospitality. But they will turn their back on God. They will turn their back on God's presence, they will turn their back on God's tabernacle and house. And they will bring the curse upon themselves by turning their back on redemption. In Numbers 25, Moses then says, after Balaam was unable to curse, that while Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. For they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. God's people sinned against his love. They sinned against his covenant love. The nations saw. The nations trembled and quaked. They saw the love of God and redeeming his people to be a light to the nations. They heard over and over again, blessing and blessing and blessing. And even when other nations did not show them hospitality, God provided for all of their needs. And wicked Balaam, who is still in our midst, he came along and he could not open his mouth to curse, only to bless. But he led them astray and said, you know, if your gods and goddesses show hospitality, they will turn their back. It, it's, it's like a marriage. They will turn their back on the God of their covenant, the husband of the covenant. And they will play the harlot with your gods and your goddesses. And that's what happened. Peter is saying to us, that is why we must pay careful attention. There will be people and churches proclaiming the word of God on their lips. And you, I, I heard them, they, they proclaimed the blessing of God over and over 
and yet they are still leading God's people astray. You can begin to tell them through their greed, through their immorality, their lawlessness. Turn your back on the worship of God. Turn your back on that tabernacle that God built and turn to the gods and goddesses. May God deliver us from evil. May God preserve us from sin and temptation. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you so very much that for the, the story, the good news, the gospel of, of your love and your salvation, and like a, a husband loving a wife, his wife, to, to think of how your people played the harlot. Even in the, the very presence of of the tabernacle and the priesthood. We thank you for Peter's rem reminder that this very same kind of thing from the lips of priests and holy men and ministers and evangelists that there will be many like Balaam who would lead the people astray. Lord, will you deliver us? Will you enable us? Will you grant your spirit to us that we would pay careful attention to your word. And I pray for those who are still outside of the covenant, that they would hear the voice and the invitation of the spirit and of your bride to come, to let the one who is thirsty to come, that the one who wishes to drink of the water of life, that they would come, that they would hear the hospitality of the church, and I pray that we would not be giving any hospitality to the world, the flesh, or the devil. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.